Hello, everyone, and welcome to this, this Ask the Editors session uh, at the AAAS Meeting 2021. Uh, I'm Sean Sanders, Director and Senior Editor for Custom Publishing at Science, and I am very pleased to be moderating this Q&A with three editors who oversee research and insights uh, sections of the journal Science. Uh, they are here today to answer your questions about trends in scientific research, publishing in science, and what 2021 might have in store for us. Uh, so please uh, submit your questions. Uh, we'll get to as many as we can during the half hour that we have. And to get us started, um, I would like to welcome our three editors today. We have Dr. Lisa Chung, who is the Insights Editor, uh, Dr. Velda Vinson, the Research Editor for Life Sciences, uh, and Dr. Jake Yeston, our research editor for physical sciences. So welcome to all of you. Uh, thanks so much for making the time to do this. Um, and uh, I'm going to uh, start us off with a question that I'm sure is on everyone's minds or a topic on everyone's minds and that is COVID. So uh, Velda, why don't I come to you for the, the first question? Uh, what do you think about um, the kind of jobs that journalists are doing covering science in general and the COVID pandemic uh, in particular? Um, so specifically uh, what journalists are doing. Um, so I think, I, I think overall um, journalists are doing a, a good job. Um, it's been interesting to watch um, throughout the pandemic. I think journalists have become more appreciative of the um, journal of the referee, refereed published article, the final article published in the journal, uh, because more than ever, all of these, um, all of this research is going up on BioArchive or MedArchive, um, which is great because it's then immediately available to scientists. But then it takes the time, it comes to the journals, it goes through peer review, changes happen, and it's been really heartening to see that. Um, journalists have really wanted that validated version of the paper before they um, are too confident about, about their um, reporting. Mm -hmm. Lisa, how about I come to you next? Um, so how is science handling this, this deluge of COVID research and commentary? There is so much to write about framed in the world of the pandemic right now. We have plenty of people telling us about their ideas, things they wanna write about. We have relationships with experts in the field and we are able to address very quickly things like um, airborne transmission when the question about masks was uh, circulating, repurposing drugs. Uh, vaccine trial ethics. We were able to get on these issues on people's minds very quickly. Um, and so there was no lack of ideas or lack of people wanting to talk about them. And we we're really fortunate in that we have great relations with the top experts in the field. Excellent. So Jake, you're the, you're the physical sciences research editor. Do you feel a little bit left out with all this focus on COVID. I mean, what's happening in, in the fields that you're looking at? Are, are people reluctant to publish because they don't want to get drowned out by, by everything else that's happening? Um, you know, it's interesting. So I, I, I wouldn't say I felt left out. I, I, I honestly would say I felt a bit relieved, you know, that I, I've been working normal hours, whereas, you know, Valda <laughs> and her team have been, and, and Lisa too, obviously, it's been almost superhuman you know, how much work they've been getting done. And, you know, I, I have to say, watching it myself, what, what really impresses me is they've been doing it all without, relax, without relaxing their standards at all. That I think is, you know, one of the most impressive things is, is just across the board, what an excellent job the bio side has been doing of um, making sure that what we publish is, is vetted in, in the strictest and, and most helpful way possible. Um, in terms of the physical sciences, you know, I think we, we've basically just been chugging along. I mean, I think, you know, what a lot of people said at the beginning was that when the lab shut down, it was an opportunity for people to write up papers that maybe they had been setting aside, you know, piling up, oh, well, we'll, we'll get to writing up as soon as we finish this experiment. And, you know, oh, well, experiment's done, whether you like it or not, so go write your paper. And so I think mm -hmm. there was a bit of a backlog there that, um, that, that we benefited from coming in. And um, 
now, you know, fortunately, it looks like quite a few labs have been opened back up. You know, I think some of the students have been, um, you know, back in lab, ideally socially distancing, wearing masks and so forth. And um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I would say for us, um, obviously, there, there, there were, uh, there was a lot of chaos in a lot of people's lives. But on the whole, we, we still got quite a few really impressive studies. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, so, um, Velda, why don't I come back to you with this one? Um, what what are topics important to scientific process like uncertainty and significance, or preclinical versus clinical stages, um, that you think science, scientists and journalists and authors should be more mindful of? And you know, I think this specifically refers uh, to the the COVID papers that are coming, or the the increase in the number of papers about COVID coming in. So, uh, okay, so you're looking at, I mean, what, what we're looking at for in these papers, I think that the thing is just, as Jake had said, we're maintaining the standards that we always maintain. Um, and that, of, of course, um, we have a big focus on reproducibility. So, you know, we want all the papers we publish to be reproducible. So when we're looking at these papers, you know, even if the volume of papers really increases, we still have to keep that bar. So what we're looking at is statistics, um, you know, are the materials and methods really thorough um, so it can be reproduced? Um, if it's a preclinical, you know, has ha have all those preclinical studies been, is, you know, is there an IRB or they, if, it, if there's patients involved, are there permissions? So everything we would normally do with a preclinical or clinical paper um, or just with a paper where we want it to be reproducible. Uh, we do have in place a checklist on all our bio papers. So authors have to fill in the checklist and that, that helps us mm -hmm. um, just check that, you know, all well, the statistics has been done properly and that everything has been reported. Um, we do also have a board of um, statisticians who we can go to if we um, want some extra scrutiny for a paper. Mm -hmm. Um, so a question now, I think for Valda and Jake, um, since I, I don't, Lisa, I don't believe that you handle uh, the peer review side of things. Uh, you don't send out papers for peer review, is that right? We do send out no. some for peer review. Policy uh -huh. form are sent out for peer review okay. and some of our perspectives are, are sent out for peer review. Okay, so, so you can jump in on this one as well. So the, the question is, how, how has peer review changed um, in the last year? Um, I'm particularly interested if, you know, since people are at home more, um, they seem to be submitting more, more papers. I think there was, you probably saw a spike soon after the pandemic hit. Um, but how has this impacted peer review? Are more people available to do peer review or do you find that everyone is so busy doing other things? So Valda, you want to start us off? Yeah, I, I mean, I think we have, you know, I feel like I'm dealing with two beasts kind of. The one is the non-COVID papers and the other is the COVID papers. Mm. Um, so COVID papers at the beginning, everyone felt like we were in this huge battle to beat COVID. And so if a paper came through that looked like, you know, this was really going to contribute, people were eager to review it, no matter how much else they were doing, they would review it quickly. Um, we've run into fatigue now, mm. you know, still if we, so we can still get reviewers, but it's not quite as, as easy. Um, and, but still, if, if I sent out a paper that was, you know, this drug cures COVID, I can guarantee you I could get 10 people to review it at the drop of a hat, but <laughs> not that I would, but right. yeah, so people, so reviewers are still looking at it. How important is this paper? How important is that I review it quickly and, and are acting on those? Mm -hmm. um, on our other papers, no, I wouldn't say people are more available to review. I'd say they're less available. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the biggest issue has been that um, I think women are disproportionately affected. And so our ability to have diversity in our peer review process has become more challenging. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I credit scientists, they're still saying yes, um, everybody's just working hard to keep this enterprise going. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, we've, we've tried to give people a little extra time. I think authors also understand that, you know, since authors and reviewers are 
to a great extent, the same people, mm -hmm. you know, I think they also understand if they submit a paper, it might take a little longer, you know, people have, um, have obligations, but yeah, I mean, you know, I think, um, I, 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 I agree with Valda. I, I think if anything, you know, it's, it's, um, it's slowed down the process, just, just people, you know, especially academics, you know, um, trying to get accustomed to teaching virtually, you know, mm -hmm. helping students deal with the upheaval that, that they're obviously going through, dealing with their own families and their own home life, so. I think this affects commentary as far as people wanting to write. Mm. Um, people are usually very happy to accept an invitation to write, but I think, especially as, as what Valda said with women who are busy homeschooling now and, and right. families who are taking care of um, other family members that they hadn't anticipated, before every, everybody's got their other life going on. So it's mm. it's becoming more challenging, I think. Right, yeah, and it seems clear that, that women are being hit particularly hard um, with the greater burden of, of childcare. Um, so Velda, I'm glad that you touched on diversity because I, I do have a question here about what science, um, larger science is doing to promote diversity amongst its authors. And I know that AAAS has quite a, a large um, a program um, that was introduced in the last year to promote diversity in, in all aspects of what AAAS does, but maybe you could speak specifically to science and the, the science authors. So, you know, it's, it science there's um we're really limited on the research side um to sort of deciding who our authors are our, our authors submit i mean we may solicit papers in very rare instances but that wouldn't move the needle much i mean we 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 really are dependent on what's coming in to a large extent um but where we have tried to change things is one with our board of reviewing editors. So we've really diversified our board of reviewing editors um, with the idea that these people are role models. Mm. And so what we want is to, um, you know, just make it the norm for women to be in senior positions in science. Um, so that's what we're doing with our board of reviewing editors. Um, then we're also um, really trying for diversity among our reviewers. Um, for one thing that creates a network, we find that often when we ask someone to review, they maybe would not have been confident enough to submit a paper before then, but when we ask them to be a reviewer, they're like, oh, wow, I'm, you know, science thinks I'm great, so I'll submit my paper. Um, and I think, and the other thing is, um, the, the person who can move the needle more on authors. So, so with us, with reviewers and with Ball, we're really just trying to, um, you know, just amplify the voice of women basically and in the hope that that leads to more women authors in the long run. Lisa um, much more can move the needle quicker because they're actually choosing who writes their pieces. Right, and I wanna say that this is a priority for the editor in chief, um, Holden Thorpe. He really wants to increase the diversity of the authors, the reviewers, and even highlight areas in the commentary section that might be dominated by underrepresented groups, but are not fields that science traditionally covers. So there are a number of different things that we are trying to um, improve what science does, our own practices. I would just add that, you know, we also are really encouraging authors to self-report um, their, their gender identity and, and their racial and ethnic background. Um, we have a system in place in our author database where the, whatever information they enter there is, is kept confidential from us. It's just used in, in background statistics. So for instance, if you want to know, you know, how, how many black authors have submitted to science and how many of their papers have been accepted, that's something that we can use those sorts of statistics to determine without necessarily, um, you know, for instance, having me be able to see, oh, what is the race of this author of this paper I'm considering right now? And so that's something that we're, we're trying to encourage and we're trying to gather good data 
um, in, in those respects so that, that at least at the baseline, we know where we are. And, and then, you know, that, that can help us um, in the future try to, try to target how, how we can improve things. And obviously there's a lot of other, um, you know, outreach opportunities. There's um, meetings in my own field of chemistry. There's, you know, for instance, the, the Nobuche meeting, the black chemists and chemical engineers that, mm. that I've attended. And um, similarly in, in other fields um, where you can, you can go and try to network. Um. So Jake, let me let me stick with you for the next question, um, and that's a, I thought an interesting one about the research fields that science covers. And the question asks: like, in in what research areas have science publications um, changed the way that science is done in their fields? Do you do you have any thoughts on that uh, from the physical sciences side? How have publications you mean in 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 our journal specifically? Mm -hmm change the way that, to, to ask your question again, I, 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 want, I want to make sure I get the details okay. right. Yeah. So no, you, you have it right. So how have, have the articles that we've published in science um, shifted the field, changed the way that science is done in, in the particular fields that you cover? Do you have any examples of, you know, seminal papers that you th feel have really moved things in a field? That's, a, that's an interesting question. Um, so, I, I want to try not to, you know, only answer in chemistry, right? Because there probably are a lot of people watching who aren't just chemists. Um, mm -hmm. What I would say in chemistry, what what some of what we've done, and again, I don't want to want science in particular to take the credit for this. This is, you know, kind of a, a journal ecosystem. But you know, I think we've published a few high profile papers. Is um, we, we've published some papers in, in photochemistry and, and more recently in electrochemical methods that um, maybe are, are now moving outside of academia and into industrial practice. So mm -hmm. an idea that you know, someone comes up with that maybe at the beginning seems you know, mostly about exploring fundamental concepts. Now, you know, when, when you're in pharma and you actually are thinking, you know, what's the fastest way to make this drug? You know, I, I think more and more of, of that type of work is um, taking advantage of photochemical and, and electrochemical methods um, published in science and elsewhere that um, not the advantage of, of those types of methods is not only that um, they, they might be particularly efficient, but that they produce less um, damaging waste um, that, that, you know, than, than you have to deal with. Um, in, in other fields, you know, I think, um, I, I, you know, I mean, you, you, you asked about physical science. I mean, the, the, well, if you want, the, the I, I was going to say that, the, 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 <laughs> no, I know. I, I mean, the, 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 the sort of perfect answer to this question is um, with, with this uh, beating the diffraction limit in microscopy, which mm. was, you know, really a, 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 it was, it was a physics concept. Mm -hmm. that then got extended into, you know, physics came, was sort of the field where people came up with, you know, how you could do this in the first place, how you could do imaging below the, the, the dimensions of the light wavelength, and then shifted onto chemistry where, you know, you had to design the right kinds of molecular dyes to take advantage of this technique. And now, you know, as the, the Nobel Prize that, that went to Helen Betzik attests, you know, and now, now basically all of these papers go, go to people like, like Valda and, and like Stella Hurtley on the biology side. And so even though this started out as, um, you know, something really physical, it, its manifestation and, and the, it, its real impact, I think, has been in cell biology. Yeah, I mean, I think um, what I would want to add is that, you know, I, I don't think if we never published the paper science would still have progressed in exactly the same way. Maybe, maybe a tiny bit slower, but you know, it would have been promulgated a little bit slower, but science would still have progressed. But you know, we, we're very great. So for example, I, we, we published the initial CRISPR papers. Um, and I happened to just be looking back at them recently and was delighted to see that actually people who saw them at that time realized just how important that was. Um, uh, 
we've published, we often publish um, second rather than first. So for example, um, they were, I, I remember publishing a paper on transition um, on um, TEM, you know, when you sort of the um, microscopy where you're looking at the whole three dimensional thing. Um, and that the theory of that had already been published and initial results had already been published, but we published it when they did something that, you know, cell biologists could go, wow, look at look what this technology does. So I, I think the advantage we have is that we're so multidisciplinary um, that when we publish something, it's seen by other disciplines. So what we're really trying to do is to publish, and it's often a method where we publish the method and it's not that specific field, it's a related field that goes, wow, we can use that. Mm -hmm. And that's how we hope that we're really contributing um, to, to sort of the communication of science. Mm -hmm. So, Lisa, any, any thoughts as far as commentary and perspectives that you feel have, have moved the needle and also editorials that, you know, where, where we, we do get some really um, interesting and, and um, provocative ed editorials, um, including from our, our editor-in-chief himself? Right. I, um, so, speaking about policy then, um, we like to have, we like to invite authors who are outside the direct boundaries of scientific research. And we like to continue that trend. Um, people in science might not have a full idea of how policy or politics or even the law work at a local and national global level. And the scientists often don't have a full awareness of the broader societal and ethical concerns. Mm -hmm. um, that are important to consider with their research. So that's why um, it's important that the policy section uh, doesn't just amplify the, the voices of scientists because that would only have a very limited impact on decision makers in the policy world. You need to have the voices of economists and ethicists and legal scholars and human rights activists and all these other participants and the public to weigh in on the intersections between science and policy. And some of those, some of the experts in science are blinded to, to those intersections. So at least at science, we want to continue the trend of inviting those outside voices, either independently or partnered with scientists to write our policy pieces. Um, yes, you mentioned uh, our editorials and uh, Holden Thorpe has, um, sort of amped up the spiciness of uh, some of his commentaries, um, but we uh, have really reached out to different people um, as well. We had Madeleine Albright, the former US Secretary of State, warn about uh, an escalating nuclear arms race. We had the Princess of Jordan write for us about her concerns about um, Arab women in science. We had members of the Vatican write about how COVID has revealed um, vast gaps between poor and rich countries. Uh, and that includes gaps in who benefits from science. So we want to continue the trend of very diverse voices on the commentary page. Uh, we think that that's just a benefit to the scientific community all, overall. Mm -hmm. And talking of diverse voices, uh, just a reminder to our audience, if you would like to submit any questions, you can still do so. Just feel free to, um, there, there is a link that I believe you can go to, um, or you can pop them in the chat if you like, uh, and we'll see them there. Um, so I, the next question I, I wanted to put to all of you is, since you're all really at the coal face of science, uh, what are some of the emerging fields that you're seeing out there and what are you doing to target them to, to bring in the, the, the highest quality and the, the cutting edge articles? Um, Jake, why don't we start with, with you? So I think one of the most exciting topics in physical science right now is quantum computing. Um, you know, because it's on this really interesting threshold where, you know, it used to just be an idea. 
And now it, it's really starting to be reduced to practice. And it's still very preliminary. You know, there's a lot of questions about, you know, quite how far you have to go technologically before you do something that's, um, you know, not, not just a proof of principle, but, but you know, something, something akin to um, what you do with, with an ordinary computer. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of money in it. There's um, mm -hmm. Google, obviously, and, and IBM have very well-endowed programs um, that, that they're working on. There's a lot of work in the academic sphere, um, not necessarily just on the technology, but on algorithms and, and modeling and theory that you can use to think about how to make these systems more robust. And so I think a lot of the outreach there is really at the interface of industry and academia. And, you know, thinking about how you can, um, how you can network with those people so that you're, you're publishing things that, that are enabling. You know, I think that, that that's the real, the real crux of it in a field like that right now is you don't want to just take milestones you know, obviously the, the big companies are going to be, you know, it, it, it's not so hard to think, well, you know, we need to reach out to Google because Google has their big quantum computer. They're probably going to keep bringing in the milestones. But, you know, who is the, the maybe lesser known group out there who's going to have an algorithm or, or a system for, for error correction is, is one of the big challenges that's, that's still remaining. You know, how do you make sure that when the quantum computer runs, it's robust? And you know it it doesn't um, it, it it doesn't sort of for some reason or other lose track of the calculation while it's ongoing. That's the sort of thing that I think you know why we need to be at conferences. Obviously now they're all virtual, but you know in the future hopefully back back in person. So you're you know mm -hmm. bumping into people in the hallways and talking to them and and you know hearing about them so that if we can elevate something that you know might not have gotten as much attention if it was published elsewhere then then we're really contributing to moving that field forward mm -hmm. and I, actually i'm i'm also very interested to see similar to what we were talking about earlier with microscopy how quantum computing might bleed into other fields and be picked up right. and and used as many different applications yeah. so um lisa maybe I'll, I'll come to you next you know, infectious disease, I think that we're going to just mm. just see a burst of research in infectious disease just as a global project. What do we have to do with data sharing mm. and surveillance and working together, whatever policies and international groups have to be put into place to make that work better? Um, getting to universal vaccines um, preparing for pandemics. I think that this, so many lessons from COVID-19 now that we, we see where the gaps are and that um, we could see much more work going toward improving the situation. Uh, I think that social science is going to become more interesting as it becomes more quantitative and we may be able to see some really robust research now uh, in the pages of science. And I also think genomic epidemiology is going to be fused more with traditional epidemiology as we try to understand um, infectious disease too. So I think that those are uh, very interesting. Oh, the other thing is as far as policy is, you know, what, how does the world recover post COVID-19? And I think there's going to be discussion about how to do this with climate change and sustainability in mind. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna be see many more um, voices on this from the business world, from economists, from legal scholars, from environmentalists. So how do we recover from this um, in, a, in a larger framework? So I, I look forward to um, publishing on those areas. Great. Uh, Velda, you, you'll get the last word. <laughs> so I think obviously, um, you know, artificial intelligence is going across everything and is enabling in many different fields. So I think we're watching that. I think um, imaging is still advancing really fast. Um, so both in sort of um, being able to, to both spatial and temporal resolution. So instead of sort of doing things you know, outside of the cell, now you're kind of 
looking at the same kind of mechanistic questions right inside of the cell. Mm. So um, I, I, I think the big thing is what we're always looking at is what is the big outstanding question in this field? What is that, that sort of step that is too big for anyone to take? And then what, what you're looking for is what is the enabling technology that lets you take that step? So that's what we're always on the lookout for. Um, but I also agree with Lisa. I think although we've talk, talked a lot about, I think we're all becoming much more aware about, about the need for science to engage in social justice. Yeah. And so I really hope that we can play a role there in the coming year. Absolutely. Great. Well, unfortunately, that's about all we have time for today. Um, thanks so much to the online audience for their uh, questions and, of course, to our editors for taking the time to answer them. Um, I wish you all the best uh, for the remainder of the meeting. Stay safe, stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll see you again soon. Thanks, everyone. Thanks Bye. so much, Sean.